So I, I want to thank, first of all, to, to Kent and Gabriel for organizing this and for giving us the, the space and the, the virtual space and the, and the time uh, to talk about this now, finally, you know, getting launch uh, initiative that has been cooking for, for several years already. And just very briefly, some of you um, were with me, or at least Sarah was with me, and some of the, of the people present here when we first started moving towards this. And I think uh, we had some preliminary meetings in 2016, 2017, um, mostly to you know, touch base with different faculty on campus that we knew were working with uh, research related to the, to the Spanish speaking world, you know, Spain, Latin America, uh, Hispanic studies in this country. And in 2018, thanks to a, to a grant from, from University, we brought two consultants to campus uh, from two different uh, Latin American Iberian Studies centers with different names. You know, the, the names are uh, change very much across, across the country, but it's something that tends to be a staple in uh, Air One universities, you know, to have a center uh, of this, this configuration are the one we want to, to move forward with. And these people, these, these two consultants uh, who were directors of centers, uh, a very old established one in the University of New Mexico and a new one, the University of Kentucky, met with different people on campus, maybe with some of you already. We met with the provost, with the dean, and there was, there was enthusiasm, there was, there was support. Um, but they said, okay, you, you need to start working from, you know, from um, the faculty level, not with this. And unfortunately, I had to stop working with this because I became chair of my department, and it was my luck that Brita and Bern came, came on board in the department with the experience of themselves having been directors of similar centers in the previous institutions. So we started you know, moving the ball again, and uh, we're moving the ball also based on the fact that in the past and not so distant past, we had had in Texas Tech a Latin, Ameri La Latin American Iberian Studies program uh, that was interdisciplinary in nature uh, with uh, geography, mm. Spanish, uh, history, you know, different departments participating in this. It was a minor. But the person who knows more about this is Sarah Gengerich, and I would like her to talk to talk to us briefly about this uh, before Brita and, and Bern talk about you know, the, the new, bigger, better reincarnation that we are hoping uh, to put together you know, with the help of many good people. So Sarah, do you want to, to talk to us about this? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much again to all, all of you who are attending and, uh, and thank you for the opportunity, Kent and, and Gabriel. Um, just, just really briefly, there, there's not much history to tell uh, about the, <laughs> about what we used to have. Um, um, it was a minor, as Carmen said, it was a, an undergraduate minor, but also a graduate minor. Uh, it was, um, it was a practically a, pro, a small program uh, that that was in existence prior to um, to my arrival at Texas Tech. So, from 2009 to 2000. 11, I think that's when uh, those a couple of years were when, when I participated with this program. Um, there were some uh, courses that were offered um, as um, uh, uh, yeah, courses, especially for this minor that were offered in the geography department. And uh, we, we lost some of those faculty that were in, in, in that program. And then uh, quickly, uh, this program started um vanishing vanishing from our from our uh you know teaching interest and uh although we tried to revitalize it while while i was uh new at texas tech we we had a grant by the texas humanities um and uh, and, uh, and i think that helped with some activities and and, and latest events but um but i think um for what we're thinking now is just take the experiences that we had as a minor for undergraduate and graduate programs um, and, and move it in another direction now, because now we have a more stable uh, group of faculty 
an interest and and uh, we also have student interest which is the most important thing so just as far as history it was a program it was never a center and um it was it, and most importantly it was never funded by any um any uh, upper administration um, at texas tech uh, it was just a faculty initiative so um, that's, I think that's all I can say for the moment. So I could, I could let others speak. Great. Uh, well, I can step in and speak to what I've been doing um, in my role this past year. Uh, I joined the, I'm Brita Anderson in Spanish and I joined Texas Tech pretty recently. I came in in fall of 2019 um, with three years of experience as interim director of the Latin American Study Center at the University of Maryland. Um, so I have been working to get to know the institution of Texas Tech, uh, to, to understand the, the context and the previous efforts around this initiative that all preceded me. And, and I'm just, just here trying to build some momentum right now. Um, so my, my primary or at least initial uh, efforts this, this past year have been focused on the creation of an, an interdisciplinary network of researchers, um, thinking about really building this community at all levels and, and working on, on building the awareness and visibility of the fantastic work that is already happening all across Texas Tech. Um, so this year, one step that I have been working on is the creation of a faculty register of potential affiliate faculty. I, I scoured the, the websites and bios of every college and department at Tech uh, to identify those with relevant search, research activities. Sometimes we don't know what's happening across campus, right? So this was actually a great way for me to orient myself in the, the campus landscape to learn who people are and, you know, as a new faculty member. I identified 103 Texas Tech faculty members compiling a list of contact info and research specializations that is almost certainly incomplete, but nonetheless includes representation from all colleges, from CASNR to architecture, psychology, human sciences, education, and beyond. Uh, so the goal here has been to, to vi visibilize the already existing wealth of knowledge and work happening on campus and to um, begin to envision cross-disciplinary collaborations. Um, as, as it's begun in recent years, the majority of the impetus for this program has come out of CMLL, um, but the ultimate goal is that this be a much large, that this center and this initiative be much larger than any one de department, and that it really put us in, in productive communication with one another across any departmental or co college divides. Um, second area of focus this year has been uh, actively applying for grants. Um, so we started with, with internal and smaller scale grants this year. Uh, with, mix, with mixed success, we are also applying for NEH grants, uh, Mellon, have our eyes on, on grants that are HSI specific uh, with the hopes of being able to be in a position to qualify for Title VI Department of Education area studies funding in the next few years. Um, that's a, a competitive large scale grant that requires a high level of demonstrated institutional investment, which is something that um, Berndt can actually speak to much better than me. But, but you know, well, while grant writing is a big part of what we are doing and plan to do, I would assert that a center of this type cannot thrive and meet faculty, student, and community needs without considerable internal institutional financial support. And um, Maya in a bit is gonna speak about funding models at other universities. And I think that she will provide excellent points of comparison that are helpful as we consider the, the economic realities of the center. Um, thirdly, and probably what I'm most excited about that has most recently happened around this initiative is the creation of a working group. Um, we have an application in with, for the Humanities, Humanities Center funding uh, to support kind of building a, a set structure around meeting, facilitating public dialogue such as this one, building momentum, and, and really diversifying the perspectives 
working to identify our, our strengths and priorities. Um, but, you know, beyond even the Humanity Center funding for the working group, um, which consists of 16 individuals, including two graduate representatives with representation from all colleges at Texas Tech, um, that working group, even beyond the funding, I think it's an important first step in, in expanding this network and initiative to cross disciplines and departments. Um, some of the ongoing conversations that we have been having and that we know we will continue to have, uh, first is around the name of this center. There are such charged ideological implications with any name, right? So we are, we are aiming for inclusivity and a framework that speaks beyond geographic particularities to examine global flows of communication and people. Uh, we've also somewhat strategically considered the use of the term Hispanic in order to heighten our visibility and awareness as an HSI and in order to, to, to work to target HSI specific funding. Uh, while at the same time balancing our awareness of, of the colonial implications for many people of that term. Um, so previously, the, the work around this initiative was called the, the Latin American and Iberian Studies Program. Um, that inclusion of Iberian is absolutely intentional in order to highlight and, and tap into our strengths of established international campuses, both in Sevilla and Costa Rica. Um, we're, we're now using the, the potential use of the Center for Studies of the Hispanic World while recognizing that there's also exclusions there of Portuguese and Brazilian territories, as well as running the risk of highlighting kind of a Spanish colonial identity and influence over Afro, Latino and indigenous representation. So we recognize the complexities of these decisions and invite you into the conversation. Um, in the amount of time that uh, remains, I'd like to share the screen to give you a brief view of the working, uh, the working mission statement, which is something that will absolutely need to be rewritten, but I think it speaks to some of the things that we've been considering in terms of priorities and possible directions for this center. Um, so I'll go ahead and read this and then pass the torch. Um, so the, the Hispanic World Working Group seeks to mobilize the TTU community around a collectively and clearly defined vision of our mission as a Hispanic serving institution. We will accomplish this by creating a series of forums for public input, um, much like this one, creating an interdisciplinary network of TTU Latinx, Latin Americanist, and Iberian researchers, and collaborating on a series of federal grant submissions. And then we get into the actual mission statement, right? Um, which I know needs to be needs to be refined. And I think as, a, as we're in this phase of kind of dreaming big, envisioning what's going to happen, it's easy to, to list a little bit too much. And so this is what we have. And we're really in the stage right now of bringing in more input to refine where our priorities and vision lie. Um, so what we have right now is um, the center um, for studies of the Hispanic world will approach Lubbock's local his Hispanic history and culture as an asset and a crucial point of connection with Hispanic cultures globally. The center will prioritize the creation of innovative dis interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, you know what, I'm sorry. The mission statement is further down. I apologize, that was just an overview. Um, you're getting a, a, a brief look at the 103 colleagues here that do incredible work across campus. And it's a lot of us. Here we go. The mission of the Center for Studies of the Hispanic World is to build a crucial network of faculty, students, and community members committed to learning and actively engaging with Hispanic concerns throughout the world. The center's purpose is threefold. Fostering one, faculty collaboration, so this interdisciplinary connect, connection um, across campuses, two, undergraduate and graduate uh, student opportunities. This is internships, this is certificates, uh, this is ideally funding for students as well, right? And three, local and international public engagement. So that's a lot. <laughs> um, 
The center will operate as a space for faculty to connect, an inter institutional focal point that sparks creative alliances and collaborative projects for researchers across disciplines. Through its interdisciplinary curriculum and programming, the center will promote students' intercultural competence, preparing them to engage productively with cultural difference in their lives and careers beyond Texas Tech. The, the center will celebrate the linguistic, ethnic, and cultural diversity of the university and its community by spearheading public-facing collaboration and service. We will draw on the strengths of Lubbock's commu local community to operate as a strategic intermediary between West Texas and global iterations of Hispanic culture. So that, that desire to ground us ourselves in the local and bridge to the global communication. Um, the center will not only function as a point of connection with our well-established campuses in Sevilla and Costa Rica, but will also promote transnational dialogues by expanding alliances with research centers throughout the Spanish speaking world. The inquiries stimulated through the center will prioritize an exploration of indigenous, Afro-Latino and diasporic Latinx populations. Um, the center will promote Texas Tech's mission as a Hispanic serving institution by facilitating dialogue and cooperation across the large number of TTU faculty engaged in Hispanic related research, the diverse student body and local and global um, community members. So I, I'm reading that and I'm aware it's, it's too much, but um, you know, I hope that the, the takeaway from that is uh, that we, we have energy, we have momentum, and we're in a moment of really needing to uh, really think about where our strengths lie and, and what, what our um, primary focus is going to be. Um, Carmen, am I out of time? Probably. What I also had to share with you here is the, the initial um, input from our working group members. We got some really exciting feedback from them um, about possible priorities and focuses for the center. So if there's time later on, I can share those comments. Yeah, sorry, Brita, I, I got a phone call in the meantime, oh. so I, I lost track of time, but I think I think we should be That was fine. enough, yeah, okay. thank you. <laughs> I always have thank too much you. to say. Thank you, thank you. So, Baron, do you want to go ahead? Um, I think it actually makes sense or as, um, um, Britt already mentioned as Maya Edwards has prepared something. Maybe I can give a, a quick introduction here and in saying that uh, my name is Bernd Ryder and um, I emailed the people on the working group um, about me. I just recently joined Texas Tech. I'm a political scientist by training. I came here after uh, being 15 years at, at the University of South Florida. Um, I was hired to the University of South Florida uh, into the Institute for the Study of Latin American and Caribbean, which uh, I directed over the last years. And um, I'm here now and I'm, I'm here to help along any of these initiatives towards establishing a center. Um, but I, we have two grad students who have done some, and what I have for today is actually, I, pre, I have prepared a little PowerPoint as well. But I also, I know there's Maya Edwards who has prepared uh, a presentation as well as uh, Misael Duarte, both of whom have um, done this. Uh, my, I have asked Maya Edwards if she could tell us what other centers are doing. Um, and I have asked um, Misael to uh, highlight some of the more main so uh, funding sources available to Hispanic serving institutions. Um, the, the reason for this is on the one side, you know, um, for Maya Edwards' presentation, um, we need a mission statement, of course, but what's really behind a mission statement is identifying a niche so we can do something uh, that doesn't just replicate what other people do, but where we can say, we do this here well, and maybe better than anywhere else. Um, so we have a strength, something that allows us to be recognized. And that's why Maya Edwards has um, will help us with this. So hopefully, Maya, are you ready to, to, to tell us about these other centers? I'm ready. All right, then. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Thank you for your invitation and for time here. I'm going to try to keep things brief, though there is so much to say. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, let's go. Can y'all see? 
And you can hear me well? Yes. Okay. So, um, as, doctor, as Dr. Ryder said, I'm going to be talking about mapping existing centers. There's no way that I could speak about all of the centers that are happening across the country or even in our region, but I've decided to focus on seven, four of which Dr. Ryder asked me to speak to, and then three for just the, the, the length of time that they've been um, in existence and the work that they're doing. So here we go. Um, what we're going to do quickly is map these centers. We're going to talk about the names that they have, the mission statements. Briefly, what I've done is just pull um, from each of the mission statements what was common or noteworthy to all of them. It would be impossible to speak to every single one of them in the short time that we have together. But I did create a document um, talking about the names of the centers, the mission statements, the degree, degrees offered, and the funding, which I'm happy to share with you all later. Um, We'll talk about the degrees that are offered, funding, how people fund themselves, and then community relationships and engagement. So um, this is a fun map that I made of the seven centers that we're going to be focusing on. Um, it was really interesting to look at them all um, and engaging. I was excited about what we could become um, in looking at what, what's being done right now. Um, one of the most exciting, I have to say, is really close to home. It's the Teresa Lozano Long Institute at U, uh, UT Austin. Wow, they're doing so much. And really importantly, they're funded externally and internally. So that department, that university funding, that university support seems to really be going a long way. Um, university of Florida is another that has been in existence for quite a long time. And the list that they were willing to share of their funding opportunities was also quite noteworthy. We'll see that in a moment. Um, Tulane University has been around for quite a long time. University of Kentucky, um, one of our visitors from 2017 came from this university. University of Pittsburgh is close to my home in Cleveland, Ohio, and they've been um, around for a long time. University of Arizona and New Mexico. University of New Mexico. Um, okay, that's where we're focusing on. Now that we know where we are, the names. So here we are. Teresa, some of the names, what you'll see, some of them are named for patrons. So UT Austin Center, Teresa Long Institute is named for um, oh, patron. So they are really um, blessed to have a $10 million. I, I was, I doubted myself when I saw this thinking about Spanish. Is it 10 mil, 10,000? Or am I really seeing $10 million of an endowment that they have? They have a $10 million endowment because of Ter Teresa Lozano Long. Um, and they also have external funding. Um, so yeah, you'll see some of the, the centers are named for specific patrons. You'll see that Latin American studies is quite common across all of the names. Here, Kentucky includes the Caribbean and Latino, or the Caribbean in the name of Latino studies as well. Um, Stone Center, yet again, another patron. So that's kind of what the names are. Iberian Institute in New Mexico um, is something that we don't see explicitly stated in other centers. Mission statements. Again, I've just pulled what um, is either common or really noteworthy. So this idea of creating and promoting interdisciplinary knowledge is important across all of the centers. All of them mentioned professors, hundreds of professors working um, interdisciplinary across fields um, to promote knowledge and understanding. Um, providing faculty with resources and intellectual environment um, so that, and students with this, with resources so that they could um, move towards a successful career was important. Community engagement, both regionally, nationally, and internationally. And this is one of the areas where I think we stand out um, in that our current mission statement mentions quite, quite literally working with Lubbock's community. You know, not that the other students don't work with their local communities, but um, we work with our local community and then our center in Sevilla is different than what I've seen in other of these mission statements. Celebrating diversity. Um, so expanding on what this understanding of Latino, the, the centers means, the Latin American centers mean, and then talking about cultural agency, social inequities, and sustainable democracies. 
Degrees and certificates. So men, again, this is general, not to one specific center, but um, there are there are centers that offer bachelor's bachelor's degrees in arts and sciences, master's degrees, um, PhDs, several certificates um, that get quite specific, internships, and also travel funding and study abroad opportunities. Funding. So I mentioned the Teresa Lozano um, Center that has a $10 million endowment fund. Um, that is the largest that I've seen, but I've also seen $10,000 private endowment funds, private donations where people sign on to a website and they can offer money either annually or um, just as a one-time donation, fundraising events that are, all, that are organized by the centers, um, some of which the, the Teresa Lozano mentioned um, working towards matching their endowment fund, and then grants, lots of grants. Um, there was a mention of the NEH grant, but not about the amount that they were granted, NSF up to $499,000, Andrew Mellon Foundation $700,000, Wildlife Conservation. These are mostly Florida University. It was really gracious to talk about how much money they've gotten and from where. Um, Wildlife Conservation, $36,000 towards a specific project, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, over a million dollars, as well as Title, Title VI funding, and then a Tinker Foundation. So that's where the funding is coming from. And then I wanted to speak to the community relationships and communications. So every single one of the institutes or the centers that I looked up um, had really strong relationships and established relationships with their university libraries, which is really important in terms of research and in create and well, the, these established relationships with the libraries. They have a really strong social media presence. Every single one of them had an active Facebook page. And I'm talking posting as of 30 minutes ago, you know, about things, anything that was going on in their university um, organization of events. Um, really strong social media presence. They had um, also, what is the, the bird one called? Twitter? Yeah, Twitter, Instagram. Um, in any case, um, so that seems to be something that I would think would be important for us to think towards. Um, and then community facing projects, most of them talked about K-12 in education. So creating resources to offer to schools. Um, and then they have digital repositories, these projects that many of them were speaking to, um, speaking about oral histories. So one was talking about um, gauging the oral, like maintaining oral histories in this current time that we're in, this strange time that we're in, and also um, historically, and then digital projects, which is also something that we're looking towards creating this digital mapping. And that's all I have for today. Thank you so much, Maya. That was very um, helpful, and I think it it provides an overview of um, of what's out there, so that we can better understand what's possible and where we can situate ourselves. So, thank you so much. Um, I would then say the next person that has prepared something uh, similar. This is already moving into something more concrete. Is funding sources, and given that this is now a Hispanic-serving institution, I have asked Misael Duarte to highlight some of the very specific funding opportunities available to Hispanic serving institutions. I told him to only focus on two or three. Misael, are you, could you talk about that? Yeah, are you ready? Can I share my screen? Uh, you should be able to. Yes. Okay. All right, Misael. Okay. Can I see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Misael Duarte. I I can do a PhD program in Spanish. Uh, today I I going to do a a summary of about two important grants we had to focus on. Uh, the first is uh, the um, U.S. Department of Education is an uh, important uh, grant. Uh, we have planned to apply uh, the program and uh, with this uh, with this grant is uh, to provide grants established strike 
strike 10 to an operate the language and international storage center um, with the character specific is to to teaching mother foreign language and also um, grant su support uh, instruction in files needed to provide full understanding areas or region or country countries uh, when where uh, uh, speaking this this language, uh, next uh, important uh, grant support is research and training international story. Uh, finally, this program work with language aspect and professional and other file um, a, a study. Um, next. I will talk, Michelle, I will talk about Title VI specifically, so you don't have to talk too much about yeah. Title VI. Yes, uh, the, um, the grants supporting of this type of project is, uh, how I told you, teach, teach a lesson model for the language, uh, to provide instruction file and uh, full understanding areas, uh, to be uh, a very important Break is our uh, resources for research and training international foreign language. Uh, it is a good opportunity with uh, for our projects and um, additional information. Who who may apply in general in, in institution of higher education and then um, Hispanic Serbic institution is the important. Uh, focus on for this uh, this grant. Uh, we know uh, TTU is a Hispanic survey institution, and then another uh, grant is a Andrew Mellon Foundation grant. Another important uh, grant. Uh, this program uh, provide um, and strengthen to enter system higher education and humanities. It's uh, another important character to with this this grant. Um, uh, work with uh, research in university and uh, institute for advanced stories six, six to health institution. Um, other important aspect for this program is to promote in initiatives in university to exchange information of result or research result of research and institutional practice. Um, it, this grant has uh, four programs. I, I going to talk about only the first program. I, I, I think it's the, the program we can to apply is uh, higher learning. Higher learning program work with college, university and organization and higher learning in focus in historical underserved population, including no traditional and encouraged, encouraged student. Uh, the other three programs I think is very important, but uh, maybe in another occasion we, we talk uh, about it. Um, that's it, Emma. that's it my, my presentation. Thank you, Michelle. Perfect timing. I was I was about to say, you know, start wrapping up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. wonderful. All right. So I have also um, prepared a little PowerPoint, and I will share my screen. Um, let me see if this works. I will actually. I have prepared a PowerPoint about. Title VI funding. Um, but what got lost, lost in translation between Misael and I was that there is actually a funding a source available for specifically, and this is the website, um, Hispanic Serving Institutions. This is Title V, Developing Hispanic Serving Institutions. So I encourage all of you to uh, look at this because this is something we are eligible to do. Um, and here there's some uh, subdivisions here, but this is something we should look into. 
uh, and I guess this is at this point a call to say, um, if, if any of you think about applying for grants, please keep this in mind. And so we can maybe um, be co-PIs in this and, and put this into a grant to say, well, this is, a, we, we want to aim for developing it, uh, our Hispanic serving institution here. So I think this is actually what I had in mind with the, with the specific Hispanic serving institutions grants. Um, but I will, I have not prepared to talk about this. I have prepared to talk about Title VI. So I will share again this here, which is a PowerPoint on, his, on Title VI. On Title VI, if, uh, some of the centers that uh, Maya mentioned receive funding from Title VI. There's a similar web page that you can see similar to the one I just showed. Um, this is for National Resource Centers, um, Title VI. This is for most, for the established centers has been a way to maintain themselves financially. Maya said, you know, the Lozano Institute, they have get about a million dollars from, uh, from the Department of Education. The, the, uh, right now, FIU in Miami is funded. Uh, Tulane is funded, uh, has been funded. The University of Florida is the oldest center in the country continues to be funded through this. So there's some very established programs and there's always some new ones. FIU only is uh, doing this for the second time. Um, normally when, when uh, institutions or centers that is apply for this, they apply together for national, to be a re national resource center and for foreign language and area studies fellowships program. This is the link for that. Um, so this is the, this is the um, description. This is just from their website. Grants establish and strengthen and operate language and area of international study centers. There will be national resources for teaching any modern foreign language. This is not to build up a center. This is, uh, and I have to say, I have applied for this from my own center in, in Tampa, Florida, the Institute for Latin American Caribbean Studies. Uh, and we did not get it because they told us, well, you need to have these resources already in place. This is not a grant that allows you to build those resources up. You need to demonstrate that you are already a, a center that has a national projection and has resources of national relevance. They support instruction in fields needed to provide full understanding of areas, region, countries, research, training, international studies, work in the language aspect of professional and other fields of study and instruction research on issues of world affairs. types of projects. So they have, there's comprehensive and undergrad national resource centers, which teach at least one modern foreign language, instruction in the fields. So this is not just language, this is beyond language. This is international studies, global studies. So this would also mean involving a Texas Tech, there is a global studies minor housed in uh, political science, as well as a international studies minor also housed in political science. So that would also require collaboration with, with them. Um, this significantly comes with money to send students abroad over the summer in study abroad programs for language instruction mostly, as well as research. So this is, again, um, this is a large additional information on that grant. Uh, and if you look, just glance at this, you will see that there's these different types, but I highlighted some important things, modern foreign languages, the area studies component, uh, the international studies component, world affairs. So this, this tells us this is beyond just language. And down here for a comprehensive center, um, it highlights the library as well as in the undergrad center, library holdings. So that one of the things that when we applied and did not get this, this sort of funding was because our library collections were not strong enough. Um, there is a competition uh, open for 2020 this is, this is for every uh, four years. Uh, institutions can apply every four years. I do not believe, to tell you the truth, that we are in a position to apply uh, 2020. So in my assessment, Texas Tech could apply in 26. That means that we need to get our act together if we want to apply by 2025, gives us about four years or so to put ourselves in a position where we can be competitively applying. The component of language instruction here is for foreign language and area studies fellowships are provided for students, mostly for study abroad.
types of projects here again um, is for four years, this normally goes together. If, if we apply to become a national resource center, we would also apply parallel to receive these FLAS uh, fellowships. So there is institutional payment, substance, subsistence allowance, fellowships of $18,000 for grad students, 10,000 for undergrad students. There is institutional payment required. This always comes with a requirement uh, of a counterpart of the institution of the university paying their part, even if it's maybe a third or a quarter, to demonstrate that the university is invested in this. Um, then there is a there's areas of emphasis, and that's interesting and important to remember when applying. This is from from the Department of Education, the Title VI of Higher Education Act of 1965, as amended requires that each institution of higher education desiring a grant shall include in the application explanation of how the activities funded by the grant will reflect diverse perspective and a right range of views and generate debate and a description of how the applicants will encourage a government service for national need. And that the areas of national need is what one needs to keep in mind when applying because the areas of, of national need and language priorities right now do not include Spanish. However, they do include Portuguese and Quechua. The areas of need, doing, uh, there is one area of need, which is defined as the Western Hemisphere. So this is how it's defined. This is just from the Department of Education. These were the uh, grantees of 2018 and you see how much money they received per year. So there's some of them that uh, Maya mentioned, Florida International, she didn't, I guess, Tulane, Arizona, Florida, yeah. Texas, Austin is, Texas, Austin, of course, is the top program Latin American studies in the country. They have a PhD in Latin American studies. It has a very high regard and is very highly considered. So that's, that is really the top program in the country. Even though, as I said, Flor University of Florida's program is the oldest. So these are the grantees. All of this is available on this website I showed you earlier. I can share this with you if you want. And in the website, you can click on these and you can see even the application. You, so if we should decide to apply, we can look at exactly how is it that these institutions applied and how is it that they got there? What, what sort of information did, uh, did they put? These are very long applications, about 100 pages or so, a dense application that lists all the resources available at the university. But these are they are available. It's publicly available. And we can all look at them and see how these applications of the institutions that received that money, how they applied. And that is- Aaron, since you empowered me with, with, with cutting you, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say that, like this, this is all great and, and, and exciting information, no? Uh, but I, I think we should give more space uh, for, for the, the new people in the working group, you know, to, to, to add, to the conversation, you no, know, with their own, their own views, their opinions. Well, um, if you want to wrap I, up what you're saying, well, I mentioned this. I was ready. I was done. This was it. Um, uh, just as I finished, I, as the black screen came on, that that was it. So with this, I think we have some information that um, that allows us to talk about what people think, what we can do here. Um, kind of now gazing of what other people do and what's possible, what's on the horizon. I think hopefully that allows us to talk about what we can do here. And again, I would highlight that we do need to find something sort of special here. And my only, the last contribution I would have to this discussion is to say, there are some very strong things here already that we should build on. And that includes the program in Seville, that includes the campus in Costa Rica, and that includes the, the, the minor in, in uh, um, border studies and, and uh, Mexican Chicano studies that already exist as well, as well as a global studies component that exists and the international studies component that exists. So these are the things that are here. And for this, I would wanna open it up and see what people think. Thank you so much, Bern. That was, wow, back. <laughs> One thing that I can do in order to transition into more of the input from the working group and the audience is, I'm not gonna read them all, but I'll put up on the screen here some of the comments uh, that we've gotten from working group members about what the potential priorities of the center can be, just to have that present as we continue to discuss.
the problem with this is not that we can't, I, I, at least I do not see any more the people. So I don't see if anybody raises their hand or if anybody um, wants to say something. Okay, I'll take that down then and just leave it open. So I would say, let's have a, a talk about what, what people who have been here longer, what they think uh, um, a center could be, this will trans have to translate into a name and it will have to translate into a mission statement and an identification of a niche. Um, you know, it, it, it is my understanding that I'm myself started my career as a Brazilianist and we have Antonio Ladera here who has been working on uh, the Lusophone world. So this is one of the issues that we face, how to include in the naming Brazil and Portugal. Um, that's one of the issues. And I'm I'm kind of curious um, to know what some of your thoughts are about um, collaboration with you know the Harris Institute, which already exists, and the potential for uh, a center focused on Mexic Mexican American and Latina Latino studies. Um, I mean, I could see a real strength with with three of them, and uh, you know, I guess part of that is is how people envision the relationship between uh, Latin American and Iberian studies program and um, you know, US Latinx populations, your own heritage Spanish program. I mean, how do you see that? I see Antonio has his hand up. Yeah, I think that's a, of course a, a big topic. You know, there's other initiatives and I'm, I failed to mention the Harris Center of course in the strengths that are already there. I don't think we should compete. I think we should find ways to potentialize what's already there. Antonio. Yes. Okay, so I would, um, I confess that I'm a little surprised uh, about uh, that, um, you know, about the, the name, the proposed name, of course, it's not settled yet, but Luso Hispanic would uh, certainly include Brazil, uh, Portugal and Portuguese speaking Africa. And that would, that would include 220, 200, around 232 speakers, more speakers. Uh, all the other, all the names that my, my, uh, Maya mentioned, they all include Brazil. All the, all the names of all the centers that were mentioned. Uh, this would be the only one that would exclude Brazil. I mean, as the largest country in, in Latin America, I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I think that would, that would not be a good thing for the, for this program. Um, and that's, that's basically it. I think, uh, uh there's a, a huge group of, uh, of uh, potential students and partners in the history department. We have a faculty who work with Brazil in anthropology, also in, in um, uh, you know, engineering, the engineering department. They have a, 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 a fantastic program in Brazil. Uh, it, you know, as you know, in engineering, it, uh, pro, uh, study abroad is mandatory. And they send close to 100 students every year to Brazil. Anyway, so there's a uh, and Brazil is is a country that has many many things to offer in the future, I believe. So that's that's just what I wanted to say. Luso Hispanic is one option. Latin American Iberians would certainly include Brazil, and if, and some people believe that Hispanic uh, uh, Hispanic does include Brazil and Portugal. So it's not also, you know, settled. Uh, even though I believe that Luso Hispanic would be more. Uh, would, would make it more visible or that, that presence of, of uh, Lusophone countries more visible. That, that's all, thank you. Thank you. I think you're certainly right. I mean, we do, we do not want to uh, exclude, we want to include countries, regions and existing centers and initiatives and minors. Uh, of course, we would have to decide if this would be an umbrella center that, that works uh, together with other centers or in parallel, so that's decisions we would have to make. Other other people, work. and I believe that Kent Kent uses Luso Hispanic in his talk, so that that could be uh, uh, just a possibility for discussion. Mm -hmm. I think. Sarah Sarah had her uh, something. Yes, yeah, so, sorry. I I I, I just want to say something brief because I also have to go teach uh, in a few minutes. But um, but I think let's. Um, this is wonderful, but let's not lose the point here because um, I think what is crucial. The reason why our former Latin American and Iberian studies program died out is because we didn't have institutional support. Um, and I think uh, as a program, we cannot, um, we, we cannot just um, uh, 
wish to, to start a new program. What we want is a center. And we want, um, and I think reading the, the, the notes and the advice that we received from, from the faculty that came a couple of years ago, um, they all said that um, if, if, uh, if this center is housed in the office of the provost or some, somewhere in the upper administration, that's what is going to facilitate us, the group, the working group to be stable and to uh, start forming these committees to apply to uh, different grants. Because other, I think we're doing things, our priorities are not where we, should, where we should be. We can apply for many grants, but if we don't have institutional support first, I think we're missing the point. So I think um, we need to emphasize this aspect to yeah. the upper administration. No, I think you're entirely right, Sarah. And I think that's, I think it's, it's, to, it's also to me clear that we can do whatever we want to do. And it, it, it's just playing around. If the administration doesn't want this, then it's not going to happen. And we can do it in parallel or in the shadows of the administration. We, we the, the administration needs to want this. And then we can say we can help the administration to do this. So, but the administration, at least in my conversation with the provost, told me that they want to first see some activity on uh, among the faculty. So I think that's what we're doing. I think we're creating this justification so we can then take this to the provost and say, look, we're done. They, we're ready. We have this here. We have resources. We're talking about mission. We have a name. We have all of this. So now it's up to you. Do you want to do this or not? But I'm. I entirely agree. And even to Ken Wilkinson's thing, you know, even that is a decision at the end that the, the administration will have to uh, also decide, do we want three centers in, in at Texas Tech or one comprehensive center that, that, that includes other uh, different programs and centers? I don't know. I mean, that's something that I think we have to take to the provost. The, the problem seems that the provost is leaving, so I'm not sure how smart it is to take it to the current provost. There's Miguel Levario. Hello, uh, wonderful presentation from you all. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, I'm the, I guess the representative for the Center for Mexican American and Latinx Studies that we're putting forward our proposal as well. And I'll go back to Kent's question. Uh, question and I think that, you know, I think that the Harris uh, Institute, the Harris Institute, the Center for Hispanic World as it's you know, currently being named, and then the MALS Center, you know, I think they inherently lend to collaboration. I mean, we have, you know, we've just pointed out from, Maya's wonderful presentation, we have peer institutions that we could have as models, at least to start off with. I mean, we can most definitely reimagine those relationships as we move forward. But for an establishment, you know, those peer institutions have very distinct, uh, either institutes or centers that service a particular area, whether it's US-based Latinos or Latin American Iberian studies. And of course, you mentioned my alma mater, UT, which has one of the models for both our initiatives, I think, when it comes to to both our centers. So yeah, we, I, I'm excited. I hope that the university does support us. I don't think there's any reason why they should pit us against each other or, or have us fight for resources. I mean, we're, we're among our peers, we're well, we're, like I said in the previous session, we're way behind our peer institutions when it comes to these uh, academic resources and community resources. So I, I, I applaud you all and, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that we can definitely collaborate if we can think about conferences, for example, like a Pan American conference or something like that. Uh, you know, definitely to have something like that at Lubbock, in Lubbock, I think would be really a, a great initiative because people are often thinking of either California or Central Texas, but to have something like that where all three of us can, can organize and really make Lubbock a center or Northwest Texas a center in regards to how we look at Latinx, Mexican American, or Latin American uh, studies, I think would be really uh, incredible. I think we have the the intellectual capital to certainly do that, and we certainly have the passion behind among everybody here and, and those that are not in attendance right now to do that. I, I can thank you, uh, Miguel, and I can only agree that, that I don't think you can have a center that does not take in account where it's located, and and that's one of the first almost like natural vocations to say, well, here we are and Mexican American issues are very central here and we need to respond to that um, and, and take this into account. So I have no doubt that uh, the Mexican American component needs to be a strong component uh, to whatever it is we're doing so that we can have a, a, a strong connection to the local community. Uh, so yes, thank you very much for that. Other thoughts, like I said, there is this, we should sort of have a discussion about what do you think 
the strength is the strengths are of Texas Tech uh, and of this place. What do you think we can do better than other places or different than other places or where you think we could make a, a, a difference and say, well, this is what we do. And because this a little bit is about branding, but also about identity. What sort of identity we want to have? And I just arrived here, so I don't really know. Please. I mean, uh, I, I've been, you know, thinking about this uh, also since we started the, the email uh, as well. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, and, and I mean, I'm, naturally, I, I, I just started thinking about uh, about the, the, the Mexican American culture here and, and the need for. Could, could you give your background so we know for those who don't know you? Oh, I'm Carlos Portillo. I'm a, a faculty at the Department of Natural Resources Management. Uh, in the College of Agricultural Sciences. I've been here for six years. Okay. And uh, so I, I, I teach pretty much, I'm a biologist, so I teach and have some, some projects on, on ecosystem monitoring. So it's very, um, uh, you know, related to ecology in Latin America. Um, but uh, just thinking about, you know, the, you know, the, the center, um, I naturally just think about that Mexican American uh, culture and and the need for 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 understanding that I guess there there's other cent other institutes or centers here that do that, but you know having that as a strong uh, stronghold of the center I think it's it's important and it will I think it will differentiate us from 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 other centers because I, I know you know when I when I see the websites or the web pages of other centers and what they do. What they have is a lot of uh, debates on politics and contemporary politics uh, over specific issues, right? And 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 those are like like it says, the like war affairs, international relations, things like that. Um, and that's uh, I mean that that's great, but um, I was thinking like what, what could be different? Like are we repeating that? I mean, if we we are doing that again, then um, then then you know. That's it's not original, but um, but at the same time, I think we um, there has to be some organic, you know, way that that it works. There's sometimes that maybe those debates will be be great, so we have to have a space for everything really, um, and and people should be free to to participate, have the help to of, of faculty to collaborate on specific projects, whether it's in politics or in in, in the environment and things like that 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 look at international, you know, study Latin America um, in, you know, in, in, in other countries and in and, and, and the Latin America culture in the US as well. So it's, I don't know, I mean, I'm just kind of <laughs> just talking, but uh, that was what, what it came to my mind was, was we need, I mean, we need to uh, give a lot of emphasis to what we can study here in the Southwest uh, without, um, or, or and also having space for, for you know, for studying uh, things that are happening abroad and, and the culture abroad and things like that. Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, I, I, I'm very happy that you're on board with this because, you know, most of these centers, also the ones that I know, rely very strongly in, in the humanities or uh, very strongly housed in the humanities and in um, the social sciences. But these fields have had a very hard time getting support lately. The Mexican studies program in the University of Arizona uh, was cut recently, I understand. And, um, and FIU recently created a um, BA in Latin American studies, but has a very hard time recruiting students because it's, very, uh, it's not that easy to think about employability uh, you know, with, with, the, with the BA in Latin American studies. So, so this connection to, to the STEM fields this, 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 keeping this in mind, it seems oh, to yeah. me is an important component. Not yeah. that I'm in the social sciences and right now I'm in the humanities. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not saying that it's not important, but I'm saying it's, it's important to also include or, or keep this in mind, this, this connection to the STEM fields for the sake of oh, yeah. offering something attractive to students. Mm -hmm. I've seen that in, in, in the calls for proposals. I mean, they're mostly in STEM engagement of, of Hispanic um, communities. 
And I think, I mean, having the support of a center to do that, that would be great also. And something that um, that Brita put in uh, the chat about <clears throat> focusing on the sciences and agriculture, I think that's super important. I think, you know, another advantage that we have that sometimes we overlook is the, the very close connection with a uh, health sciences center, right? I mean, geographically connected and, and you know, a lot of institutional um, ties that I think can be very useful. And just the fact that we're in a largely rural area, that's... Uh, contextual uh, commonality that we have with, uh, you know, these areas and particularly in Latin America, right? And, and so we have access to rural populations and sort of that rural urban dynamic in a way that a lot of these other institutions uh, that Maya, you know, uh, identified and that we're familiar with uh, don't have. That doesn't mean we all become sort of rural studies specialists, but that we keep in mind that access, those resources, the, the things that distinguish, uh, you know, Lubbock and, and the South Plains from some of the other areas and, and uh, you know, try to leverage that a little bit in terms of the work we're doing and the kinds of collaborations we enter when we look for those dis, uh, interdisciplinary connections. I absolutely agree. And that's actually the one thing that someone from Brazil said that the new Texas Tech for was that they had collaborated around semi-arid and arid rural uh, agricultural issues uh, because you know Brazil has a, a large dry area as well so they they know they knew about that so I I totally agree I think it's very important to keep in mind we have and we, less, oh, and we used and, and burned we used to have a, a center called the arid studies arid studies center er, uh, Arid Land Study Center at the ICC, and the director was a Brazilian, and he worked with Brazil for well, maybe that's why they knew about it. Leslie Wolf has her hand up. Thank you. I um I just briefly want to, and I for those who who um I haven't met and and Bert, it's it's nice to meet you. Um, I'm an art historian here at Tech, and so I'm in the School of Art. So building off of what Kent just said and what was been discussed, I just want to offer up. Um, because I don't see other colleagues of mine from the School of Art here, um, that we have wonderful resources locally in the arts. It's something that actually is, is I think, um, it offers a lot of potential with an intersection, specifically with STEM fields, because so much of the arts that are being produced here through, um, there's CASP, which is a, a local residency program, which is really fantastic. Um, but also even within our own landmark arts program in the School of Art, we had Delilah Montoya has done multiple exhibitions here. You know, it's, it's, it's actually um, a really robust program that's specifically grappling with these issues of land resources, um, you know, food sovereignty, um, issues that I think are, are being dealt with in all of these STEM fields across the university, um, but in ways that, you know, obviously are, are tapping into um, the arts. And so I would just say for, um, you know, and thinking about collaborations and, and ways to go forward, um, there's really robust local institutions that have um, the potential to, I think, intersect with the center in, in really great ways, specifically in terms of the arts and specifically in terms of this kind of like West Texas, um, uh, the geopolitics, and there's also a lot of um, a lot of us faculty in the School of Art who are uh, working with Marfa, and so that could again be something that we might want to um, think about emphasizing in some sort of shape or form. Um, so that's all very vague, but that's just to say that the arts are you know here for for the taking in a way that I think will speak to the STEM fields uh, in a, a useful manner. Well, I think that's exactly what we need. You know, this is vague at this point, and I really appreciate your input because we, I think this is already highlighting some things that we could highlight ourselves that are not, that, that do not exist elsewhere. You know, like I said, most centers are built around the social sciences and, and humanities, um, and the arts um, are not as involved, and STEMs fields are not as involved, and the rural aspects. So these are all things that we, we might choose to to you know, build an identity around, and that, which doesn't mean that we can't do other things, but it, it means, well, we are here in West Texas, uh, and this is what's going on here, and this is what's relevant. So we, it, it's, I think it's, it has a great potential. So thank you very much. 
other voices. There's so many people here. Jeffrey Belknap, Dean Belknap's hand is up. Oh, I didn't see that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, um, say um, something relevant to this conversation about STEM. We have just, um, through a very complicated process, approved a visiting students program for all of the degrees that we offer on our campus, which are STEM and business fields. But for example, this summer, we were planning to have some 60 students here. Um, and we now have uh, visiting fr uh, from Lubbock. And we will now have engineering students here every semester. And so uh, the good thing, as you know, the College of Engineering has that mandatory international study uh, option, excuse me, the, ma the mandatory international study requirement. And we're hoping that Costa Rica, along with Sevilla, will be become, uh, or that Costa Rica will become another destination as popular as Sevilla for engineering students. So um, there may be a way that this important conversation about the STEAM or the integration of the arts and STEM through STEAM could have a foot in Costa Rican experiences in ways that we uh, could talk about. So I'm just sort of raising my hand in, in support of these innovative conversations about partnering with engineering. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. I, I think having a, having a campus in Costa Rica is something that almost nobody has. So it, it's such an attractive uh, location. You don't have to convince students to go to Costa Rica. They want to go. Um, so that's, that's great. That's a great asset. Just like the other assets we talked about, the, the Sevilla component, the Harris Center, the, the minor in, in Mexican American and border studies. So all of these things are already here. So that's great assets. And definitely Costa Rica, that's, that's, that's a no brainer in my mind. I, I think the, the close relationship with CMLL um, can be really helpful in that regard because um, I, I could see where, you know, the academic program as well as the center could open opportunities for students to really explore how, you know, their, their language training and their cultural learning in CMLL courses can be applied in specific disciplines or even in uh, specific industries. I know we've had a program in Costa Rica where it was go down and work with some uh, strategic communication uh, companies in uh, Costa Rica. So that offers access that would be difficult doing it on your own, right? Because it's already set up institutionally for students to be able to apply what they're learning in their fields, but also practice their, their language in professional settings and, you know, social settings with, um, with local speakers. And uh, I could just see how, you know, having this really strong grounding in, in languages, but with an orientation toward interdisciplinarity and working with, with other uh, programs could really uh, prepare our students very well for this, you know, globalized work context that they're entering. It seems to me that, you know, it, it makes sense that CML is, is centrally involved in all of this, because if you looked at the National Resource Center site, this is all about language and then something else, language for something else, for either you know, cultural competency, regional competency, or the STEM fields, but without the language, none of this goes. So I think that, that it makes sense the way you frame this. Um, well, and, and, and if, if I could just sort of add, sorry to, to butt in, but I don't wanna lose the thought. Um, I, certainly the whole question of Hispanic serving institution identity and its relationship to heritage language learning. I know uh, the, uh, the department uh, has strong capacity in heritage instruction. And perhaps that could be leveraged into helping heritage learners also gain high degrees of tech technical expertise in professional settings and or uh, technical disciplines. 